Okay, welcome to Monday, June 21st, our class session. And get my paper set up here. Math 264, Delta College. And last two weeks we're looking at right now. So remember the flow of the course. You have an exam that's due tonight by 11.59. And then, you know, you'll restart the homework pattern, the homework problem due Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. And that'll wrap up this week. If you hand in the exam tonight, I'll grade that as soon as possible. Post answers, post graded papers and grade reports as soon as possible. And I'll let you know in the email. Um, People have asked questions here and there. If you have a question you want to ask, you're welcome to put it into the chat and we'll put it into the recording. Uh, I've generally shared, I think every question that was asked with everyone. So, I mean, sometimes if a question is about a specific thing for a person, I won't share that, but mostly people have asked general questions and I've shared all the general answers which is exactly what I would do, as I said in an email, exactly what I would do if we were in a classroom and you were sitting there taking the exam, you, you're welcome to ask questions. Maybe I misstated something or didn't state something clearly, but if one person asked the question, I would share it probably with the entire classroom by writing it on the board, just so that everybody has the same understanding. That's generally what I'm trying to do, make sure that everyone has the same understanding. I'm gonna take us past our website for just a second, just so you can get the 10,000 foot view and see where we are. So then we'll get going into some problem solving. Basic topics today or sinusoidal forcing, complexification, and resonance. So we're trying to look at sections 4.2 and 4.3. Concentrating still on damped harmonic oscillators. So let's go past our website for just a second. Make sure you see what I see what you see. Okay, good. So, uh, so, you know, natural stuff, semesters, math 264, class sessions. Here's week five. So here's a short summary of week five right here. Link to exam two, assignments folder, et cetera. Now you can see a lot of these things the first four weeks in your rear view mirror. So we are here in the fifth week We have a nice little variety of things to look at. Uh, chapter four, you know, as, as we go along, things have been going from more general and more theoretical to more specific. That's good. That's what we're trying to do is lay the foundation, you know, build towards the top of the pyramid, if this is a pyramid. So, in this week, we're going to finish up chapter four. Last week, we took a little detour in chapter five, which was fun. But we're going to finish up chapter four, which is specifically really about damped harmonic oscillators. A lot of truth about second order linear equations in general, but the most important of the example of that is damped harmonic oscillators. And then it's not really a detour, it's kind of a, another useful approximation technique in Appendix B, which we'll take a quick look at. But then we'll begin our final mission, which is the Laplace transform. If you want to think of a theme for week five and week six, the theme is that we're dealing with progressively more difficult driving functions. And the Laplace transform is a very powerful weapon for doing that. We're in a specialized context generally second order linear problems, first and second order linear problems, mostly second order right now. So second order linear differential equations, 
but there's a lot of reality described by second order linear equations. And so it doesn't hurt us or it doesn't bother us that we're focusing in, that we're using tunnel vision on those problems. Let's look at week five in general. So, you know, your typical outline, recommended problems, all good. And then introduction of Laplace transform. It's the homework problems that you're set up for this week. Exam two that you're gonna submit after exam two is submitted. We'll turn on the solutions right here. And then look ahead to exam three, which is as you recall, we had a discussion literally submitted after the end of class. And the reason why is so that we could use all the class days to do the prep and the work. So I understand the classes listed as issuing on, uh, ending on July 1. Uh, we could get together in a classroom on July 1 and take the final exam if you want. Well, first of all, I'd have to get permission to do that. and. For all I know, some of you are in Montana taking this class, so that wouldn't work very well. So I thought a better solution is just to maintain the uniformity of the first two exams. The only difference is that I acknowledge that uh, Sunday, July 4, even though it's not a business day, is a holiday. So instead of handing in on Monday, July 5, I put the submission on Tuesday, July 6. Still, I should turn those around quickly. I should get the grades submitted quickly. And then you can go about your business transferring the course or whatever you need to do. Okay, down to the handout section where we have some class session notes, office hour notes. Uh, somebody did ask a question once like, uh, office hour notes aren't listed for each day, which is okay uh, because not everybody, not every day does someone show up to the office hour and that's fine. I, someone was asking a question this morning in office hours, so I'll get that posted as soon as this class session is over. So I only post notes to the office hours if someone came to the office hours. Second order linear equations handout is gonna be really important to us that we previewed a while ago. So make sure you have a copy of that handy. And then when we talk about series solutions, I'm gonna remind you of some facts you know from Calc 2. I'm not gonna depend on a lot of knowledge there because again, the knowledge there was general, useful, important, but general. And we're gonna use it power series solutions and power series and a very specific context. So I'm just going to remind you of some power series facts of those two handouts. But, but those handouts are useful. You want them. And then we head over to the Laplace transform, where I give you some Laplace transform facts, practices, solutions to the practices. And then a fun comparison of the four methods. That's kind of a good way to look at things and then some uh, sample derivations, extra sample derivations. <coughs> Excuse me. So now then in your video section and we got some videos turned on for harmonic oscillation. So these are all about chapter four. They're kind of very useful. And then a handful or a pile of videos for chapter six, Laplace transformation. And then likewise, uh, some Mathematica for series solutions, resonant frequency. And in chapter four, these two notebooks, unforced stamped harmonic oscillators and four stamped harmonic oscillators, the four stamped harmonic oscillators notebook should be enough to create any graphics you need to create in chapter four. So I'm offering smaller collection of Mathematica notebooks here in chapter four. And again, that's because the work we're doing is more focused. Okay, let's go back to the paper and let's practice some examples. Back to paper. Okay. I seriously apologize for screwing up the recording last Thursday because 
we did have some good discussions. You had the written notes. The written notes are not the same as the recording. And I acknowledge that and I apologize that I screwed that up. So that's why I want to make sure I was recording this. But many of the things we did on Thursday, we're going to continue to do now and in chapter six. So the logic we're going to repeat several times. Let's look at one of the things we did last time. And that was in the context of a damped harmonic oscillator. We considered three basic problems that were really very, very similar. And they're, the reason they were very, very similar is they were meant to focus your attention on the behavior of the problem. I don't know if I'll use these same three today or if maybe I'll use a different three, but setting up a damped harmonic oscillator, a forced damped harmonic oscillator, I haven't added any forcing here yet. Today we'll add a new forcing. I took a basic case, a basic solution of an overdamped problem, a critically damped problem, and an underdamped problem. But notice in each case I use the same damping, four, four, and four. So I guess I created the overdamped, critically damped, and underdamped by manipulating the spring constant three, four, and five. And so as I increase the stiffness of the spring, I increase the opportunity for oscillation. You know, if the spring is not very strong, the damper is gonna overpower it, overdamped. If the spring is stronger, it overpowers the damping and oscillation results, underdamped. If there's a perfect balance between the two, then we are critically damped. No enduring oscillation. Now, we're gonna look at a lot of problems in your career, mass, damper, spring stiffness. Uh, another famous example of these is an RCL circuit for those of you interested in electrical problems. But you're never gonna reach into the bin in the lab and pull out a spring with a stiffness of three or a damper of four or a capacitor of three microfarads or whatever. You know, obviously I'm using stylized numbers or by stylized numbers, obviously I'm using special example here. But the reason why I'm doing that is to give you the format of solving the problem. That's our job in mathematics, to give you the format of solving the problem. I know that in real life, this damping coefficient is gonna be 1.025 times 10 to the minus four. And this spring stiffness, or its analogy in an RCL circuit is going to be 0.125 something somethings, whatever the units are, right? So I know that you're gonna have different and messier numbers in this. That doesn't negate what we're teaching. It simply means you're going to have to go one step further and apply what you're learning to those specific situations. You always go from the more general to the more specific. So let's do that now. And we're in section 4.2. And let's test some problems here. The title section 4.2 is sinusoidal forcing. That's just a fancy way of saying forcing with sines and cosines, or in more general terms, forcing periodically, forcing with periodic motion. And let me show you a powerful technique called complexification a big time saver 
called complexification. Now, you got to pay for every good thing you get, right? So with this new technique called complexification, you're going to have to pay for it. You have to pay for it by, we're going to do some more complex arithmetic. But it actually ends up being a time saver. So let's take a sample problem that we did last time. Actually, last time we did one of these with a sinusoidal forcing. So let's take this first problem and let's put a very simple sinusoidal forcing on it. Let's just call it uh, minus two cosine three T. And let's solve this problem with some generic initial conditions. So I got this problem right here. Y double prime plus four Y prime plus three Y equals minus two cosine three T. Let's give initial conditions of, so you know, which say, which way do we want to do it? How about just some very generic conditional conditions? Y of zero is one, Y prime of zero is zero. Even if initial conditions are generic, we have to see them reflected in our solution. So we're going to look for that. Initial position of one, initial velocity of zero. And traditionally, we've called this double star. This is our force damped harmonic oscillator. And we say we're going to solve it by first appealing to star, the unforced version of the problem. And star is a very simple problem to solve. Uh, get everybody else in the room here, good. So star is a relatively simple problem to solve. Be, be, be careful when you do this, you'll find the general solution to star, you'll have constants K1 and K2, and you'll be tempted to find out what K1 and K2 are, but it's not time yet. These initial conditions belong to the problem we were handed, double star. But the thing that I disliked about doing this problem or the one like it last time was, do you remember the YH was not hard, but the YP had to represent both cosines and sines. That was a method of undetermined coefficients. And that meant that I had to work with these two coefficients A and B, not terrible, but sines and cosines dance back and forth, minus sines dance back and forth with them. I hope I don't get one of them wrong or else I get in trouble, right? So I want to show you a faster way to do this if you're willing to dip into the complex numbers. And this is called complexification. At first demonstration, this will not seem like a super duper time saver, but as you get into more complicated problems, it could be a serious time saver. So let me set up a new problem called triple star. Y double prime plus four Y prime plus three Y. But instead of no forcing function, instead of the forcing function I want to solve, Remember, this is my target. Double star is my target. I'll invent a new forcing function. How about the forcing function, you know, different color pen, minus two e to the i three t. And that is complex function. And that's why this method is called complexification. So you're saying like, so why do I need to do that? Well, I'll show you how this saves us significant time. But first, I want you to acknowledge that the forcing function of double star is contained 
in the forcing function for triple star. Do you see that? Because e to the i3t is legally, I'll write it over here and I'll have to go to another page sooner or later. e to the i3t is legally minus two cosine three t plus i sine three t. So the minus two e to the i three t has the minus two cosine three t as the real part of this function. There's another part minus two sine three t is the imaginary part of this. So you say, why should I make this harder? By complexification, I think you mean, let's make the driving function harder. No, this makes the driving function actually easier. So let's roll with this. Let's say now that, now I'm gonna choose a YP, but I'm gonna choose a YP for triple star. And here's where you see the ease of this. Since triple star is an exponential driving function, I'm gonna say my YP must be an exponential, complex exponential driving function. So my YP can be set to AEI3T, even complex function EI3T because my YP has to imitate my driver. Now let's see what happens when I substitute in here. I got my YP prime, I got my YP double prime, and you see automatically why this is more useful. The first derivative of AEI3T is, I'll emphasize this with color, three I. AEI3T. Right? Isn't it easy to differentiate exponentials? That is going to be a lot less trouble than dancing back and forth with sines and cosines in the end. Now, what is the derivative, second derivative, of 3i a EI3T? Remember, the 3 has a constant, the a is a constant. Another derivative is going to pop down another 3i. So another 3i come down, hit this 3i, give me a minus 9. Let me write that in red. Oops, I'll keep this in green. And notice how I'm using space, and notice how I'm emphasizing my table. Why am I going to emphasize my table? Because now it's time to take three of these, four of these, and one of these. But before I do that over here, let me emphasize now the complex numbers. Zero plus three i is the complex number in front of this. Minus nine plus zero i is the complex number in front of here. What's the complex number in front of this? One plus zero i. Look at this, I got this enhanced table and Maybe it'd be even more exciting if I had a black light or something, but I'll take three of these, four of these, and one of these, and now let's add them together. Well, use what you can use to your advantage, right? Every one of these has an AEI3T, that's a common factor. But let's add up our complex numbers. I'm using too many colors now. Complex numbers come in two natural columns, right? Real part, imaginary part. So if I add these complex numbers with their scaling, three, four, and one, what do I get? Three minus nine for the real part. Let's call that minus six. And then the imaginary part only is in the second slot plus 12i. 
So here's my sum of my YPs, my complex YP, my YP for triple star. Now, what is three YPs plus four YP primes plus one YP double prime supposed to equal in triple star? It's supposed to equal this complex number here, this complex solution here, minus two EI3T. Okay, now's the place where I'm gonna have to go to another paper. Oh, I'm actually have to go to another pad of paper. I don't know how many pads of paper I've gone through during this whole episode. And uh, I also have a stack of paper two feet high next to my desk of scrap paper. Fortunately, we have a rabbit. And instead of buying bedding for the rabbit at the pet store, we just shred a lot of paper. Okay, here we go. I've got this thing sitting in front of you. I'm gonna keep one page and the next page down here. But now I get to do the same trick that I've done before. Since these two things are equal, negative six plus 12i times a must be minus two. Now think about where we're going right here. You're, what I'm doing is trying to solve the YP for triple star. And you still got a question in the back of your mind, like who cares about triple star? I'm trying to solve double star. Just be patient for a second. So my YP for triple star was A E I 3t, and I'm trying to find out what the a is. Here's an equation, tell me what the a is. So now a is minus two over negative six plus 12i. A is a complex number. That doesn't surprise me because the yp for triple star was a complex function, but you do not present complex numbers in this format, right? You always present complex numbers, what? In standard form? So what I need to do is rewrite this A, right? I could do a couple things. Well, I get a small break right here that everybody got a minus two. So if you like, I can write three minus six I. I just switch the minus sign around two because I just don't like looking at minus signs, right? But how do you really tell me what A is? Well, you have to multiply top and bottom by the conjugate. And I will demonstrate that once, but I'll put this in the context of, you know how to multiply complex numbers. So you will have to practice doing this correctly. Remember the very big benefit you have with complex numbers when you multiply two conjugates, easy to multiply two conjugates. Nine plus 36 is 45. And on the top, this multiplication is not bad either. So there's almost standard form. That is not standard form and I really want standard form. So let's write it totally legally in standard form. Let's cancel threes where we can. So I say this is 1 15th plus cancel three, cancel three, two over 15 I. So now I know what YP is. I will write it up here and I will also write it below. So my YP, now is the part where I probably have to give up this paper up here, but we'll keep it handy in case you wanna look at it. Tear the first sheet off the pad. It's always an adventure. My YP is 1 15th plus 2 15th I e to the I 3T. Now, since I know Euler's formula, I can rewrite that. 
is 1 15th plus 2 15th i cosine 3t plus i sine 3t. Now still, you're saying like, what good does solving triple star do for me? But now I'm gonna tell you the key thing and so important, I think I'm gonna write it down too. Do you see that the forcing function for double star is the real part of the forcing function for triple star? You see that right here. The forcing function for double star minus two, three, minus two cosine three T is the real part of the forcing function for triple star minus two E to the I three T. Well, I got a funny dance then. If the forcing function for double star is the real part of the forcing function for triple star, then for double star, the YP of double star will be the real part of the YP for triple star. The real part of triple stars YP. That's a cute way to back in to the YP for double star. Let's go to the other piece of paper. So here I have a complex function. This is for triple star. All I have to do to get my YP for double star is extract the real portion of this. Do you understand that this comes in two pieces? A part without the eye and a part with the eye. Well, guess what? I only care about this part. That's my YP for double star. Now, if my original problem had a sine instead of a cosine, I'd care about this part. But let's just extract the YP for double star. Let's extract the real part of this complex arithmetic. Of course, that's the part that has no I, right? So it'll be when the 1 15th strikes the cosine 3t. And it'll be when the 2 15th I strikes the I sine 3t, which would be minus 2 15th sine 3t. And voila, I just did the AB calculation that we did last time, but I did it with a complex arithmetic. And frankly, notice how I avoided solving two equations to unknowns that way. Frankly, if you can stomach this complex arithmetic, and I recommend you practice doing it, and all my recommended problems demonstrate this, you can get this answer quicker. So let me say this again in English. Since the forcing function for double star was the real part of the forcing function for star. This is a lot of writing, but it's so important it's worth writing. Since the forcing function for double star was the real part of the forcing function for triple star, the YP for double star is the real part of the YP for triple star. Complex numbers, somebody, everybody said, why should I bother with the complex numbers? There are always a lot of trouble. Now the complex numbers always have a lot of cool tricks like this up their sleeve. Because when you're doing complex arithmetic, you're literally doing two calculations at once. So you're being more efficient. That's what complex arithmetic does for you. Okay, so now I'm gonna write, go back to my original problem. Let's go back to the original problem. I'll do some paper folding so that we can have the original problem handy. 
there's our original problem right there, double star. There's my initial conditions. So now I can solve my original problem. I know the yh, which was k1 e to the minus 3t plus k2 e to the minus t. I just took that for granted that you've already solved star. Factorable roots minus three and minus one, done. My yp is right here. 1 15th cosine 3t minus 2 15th sine 3t. And now my y of t is k1 e minus 3t plus, sorry, slide paper up, k2 e minus t plus 1 15th cosine 3t plus minus 2 fifteenths sine 3t. Do you remember what I said a couple days ago about always write cosines before sines? Uh, again, that's just a habit. You don't have to do it. Well, the reason why I'm doing it is because cosine is the real part of the complex exponential. And sine is the imaginary part of the complex exponential. And we always write complex numbers in standard form, real part plus i times imaginary part. So you get in the habit of writing cosines before sines. Okay, I can plug in there, but first I wanna take my derivative, whoops, and then I'll plug in my zero. So differentiating this is not bad, just the sine and cosine are gonna dance across each other. So you go minus three K1, e to the minus three T, minus K2, e to the minus T. And then here, got a sine three T, three come out, give me a minus two fifths, cosine three T and this one fifteenth three come out cosine, give me a minus three come out minus one fifth sine three T. Now I'll plug in my initial values, which because this is a mellow group of functions is not a big deal. So plugging in T equals zero, give me a K one plus a K two plus a 1 15th, no contribution from the sine at zero. And that was supposed to equal one. Y prime at zero, give me a minus three K one, minus K two, give me a minus two fifths right here. Gonna dance with some fractions right now. And this was supposed, and nothing from the sine three T, gonna give me a zero. Now again, I don't mind how you find out K1 and K2. You can type it in the calculator. You can do whatever you do. But if I did this correctly and add these, I get minus two K1. This is a minus six fifteenths. Yeah, I just hate dealing with fractions, don't I? Minus six fifteenths gonna be a minus five fifteenths, gonna be a minus one third. And you slide it over here, you get four thirds. So I hope I'm doing this right, divided by minus two, minus two thirds. We'll have to test it. And then what do I got for 15ths? 15 15ths, 1 15th. K1 is minus 10 15ths, so minus 9 15ths. Slide on the other side, 24 15ths. It's eight fifths. I don't mind writing those down because I have to check them. And if I have an error, I have an error. So let's check in the first equation, minus 10 fifteenths plus eight fifteenths is minus two fifteenths. Oh, sorry, plus eight fifths. Minus 10 fifteenths plus 24 fifteenths is 14 fifteenths plus one fifteenth is 15 fifteenths, check. Uh, give me a positive two, subtract, eight fifths, so that's 10 fifths minus eight fifths is two fifths, minus two fifths is zero. I think these are right. Remember, we got our Mathematica notebook. It's gonna help me adjust that. Okay, and, and the, yeah, just keep poking me if I don't have the paper right. So now I'm ready to write the total, total solution to this. 
let's get the scratch work out of the way. Remember, my problem was right here. This is my whole initial value problem. And now I have the answer. And we're gonna to go to some graphics because graphics are meaningful. So I've got y of t is, get my constants together, minus two thirds e to the minus three t. Slide those papers over. Plus eight fifths e to the minus t plus one fifteenth. This is my yp over here. Cosine two t, uh, three t, excuse me. Minus two fifteenths sine three t. And this is why I regret not recording last time, but I said we were going to repeat this logic. So remember what we said last time. Now I'm going to have it on a recording. Yeah. These numbers just like random numbers. But now we're going to see how they solve this. We're going to test the solution. We're going to see graphically my initial conditions and the behavior of my solutions. So I'm going to open up that Mathematica notebook called four stamped harmonic oscillators. And I always take my Mathematica notebooks and you can download them and do this way too. I just make a copy of the Mathematica notebook so I don't overwrite my good stuff or overwrite the original. Let me share this with you. And let me make sure you see what I see. Okay, can I make the words a little bit larger, slightly? Okay, so here we go. Mm. Well, I guess we said last time, the worksheet's under development, but I think everything's pretty good. I could probably remove this note. Here are my initial conditions, one and zero. Uh, time interval, I'll leave that way for a moment. My forcing function was minus two cosine of three T. Notice the capital cosine square brackets. And my problem was four y primes, three y's. There's my f of t, y naught, b naught, got it. Let's see what Mathematica thinks the answer is. Oh, okay, so if this is happening to you and this happened to me the other day too, did I not execute this line? Let's find out. Okay, maybe I didn't execute that first line, so always do that. Uh, notice there's a little grayed out X next to the 1 15th. Mathematica wants to tell you that it's multiplying 1 15th if you didn't believe that. But let's check my numbers. I've got a 2 15th, I got a minus 10 15th. See, Mathematica doesn't simplify this very well, at least as far as I think. I actually have to I actually have to multiply this out. I'm, I'm going to ask Mathematica again. Did you simplify this? You know, this command simplify is supposed to help me, right? So I'll show you how I'm going to look at this. First of all, I just tell it to solve with the desolve value command. That is different than the desolve command that I gave you previously. So go look up in the documentation, documentation desolve value command. Okay, so now... Can I expand this? And then now there, that looks like a darn good answer. What happened when I said simplify? So you, you can play with these things, right? Then Mathematica thought, oh, I gotta get tricky. Oh, I gotta factor things out. No, I guess simplify did not help me. It doesn't always help. So I took the answer and I expanded. Now that matches mine exactly, even in the order. Do you see Mathematica writes cosines before sines? Okay, now I'm really happy. So don't overuse simplify. Expand was helpful enough. Okay, so now let's take my, well, our joint answer, Mathematica and we, and let's insert it here in my yh and yp. 
the yh is the part without sine cosine, the yp is the part without the exponentials. Let's look at this beautiful image. Well, I hope it's beautiful. That's pretty good. Uh, let's get my f of t in here. Must not have had that in there. Oh, now I see why I don't have the f of t in there. Okay, f of t was kind of busy and obnoxious, but I'm gonna keep it in just a second. Nope, that's not what I wanted to do. There, I want a little more thing. So first of all, let's focus on a forcing function, which is just the straight cos wave minus two cos three t. You see the period two in there. And now let's add my yp, which must imitate the forcing function. Imitate and lag the forcing function. Yes, it does. See, here's a valley followed by a valley, peak followed by a peak. You could say, oh, the, for, the, the yp has a peak before the forcing function. Well, that's because of the nature of the repeating. It seems that way. Now let's add the yh. which is very boring, just like dies out, right? I think I'm gonna get rid of the forcing function right now for a moment, I'll bring it back. So there's my YHYP. I'm supposed to add these two functions together to get my answer, which is Y. And I've already pre-written all this above. I've already told Mathematica what YHYP and Y are. So I'm able to just play with this plot structure. So that's the adding of the gold and blue. I get this green thing. I'm looking for that initial condition of one and zero. and I don't see the initial condition of one and zero in my green answer and that bothers me. David, great. go ahead. David, Drew put a question in the chat. Oh, yes. Hang on. So when I'm sharing a window, the chat goes somewhere else. Yes, quite possible. There you go. Because, see, I want to see my initial condition. Thank you. So let's go find out where that was. There was a minus two-thirds. You're absolutely right. Thank you very much. Oops. Doesn't matter where I put it. but Good. Now let's redo people from the top. F of T. Got it. I don't need this grid line decoration. I'm gonna remove it. Okay, f of t, my yp sitting next to it. That part was already good. Now I replace this with yh backwards. Okay, good. And now yh plus yp is a solution. still see a two zero there. So what did we do wrong there? Let's go back to the very top. I got a one zero for my initial conditions. My solution matches my solution and my solution has an initial condition of minus 10 fifteenths plus nine fifteenths. Like, maybe I'm two. Here's 24 fifteenths, 10 fifteenths, 14 fifteenths, 15 fifteenths is a one. And there's a one right there. This is why you check. So this looks good. Let's do the copy paste again. YH has no oscillation. YP has only the driving oscillation. Coming in here. Okay, something I had miscopied and pasted. I apologize for that. So let's cut this window down dramatically. Let's go 1.25 to 1.25. There we go. Here's my solution in green, which is the sum of blue plus 
orange. Everything's back in order. Just want to see a solution alone. There's a solution with zero slope and one position. Uh, kind of fun to see that imitating the driving function, but the driving function is way bigger than that. So I have to pump up the window. So do you see my total solution is imitating and lagging the driving function eventually. Okay, very good. So this at least gets onto a recording what I failed to get onto a recording last time, this logic of looking at the driving functions, the YH, the YP, putting them all together is a little busy. You can see them all together if you like. I have a handout on my website where I show you pictures of four functions and ask you to identify which is which. That's a handout worth looking at. Uh, because you can tell which function, which is which by the properties of these functions. It's important to know how to do that. There, I'll remove the driving function and just focus on the solution and the forced response and the free response. Okay, good. So this has illustrated, and we're coming up to a break, but let's return to our paper. Uh, since I mentioned that handout on my website, why don't I show it to you so you know exactly what I'm looking at. It's called first, uh, Force Damped Harmonic Oscillator Graphs. It's in the handouts for this week. And uh, we'll get to the sharing here in a second. As soon as the browser pulls up the document, here it is. On this piece of paper, I didn't do any calculations. I just showed you four, well, I guess six, problems. Each problem has four functions in it. And so in each case, one of these is the forcing function. One of them is the YH. One of them is the YP. One of them is the Y, which is the sum. Now, apart from the fact that it's color coded, I guess if I was doing this on a test or something, I'd make them all black. Because the color coding matches the mathematical notebook we were looking at in a way. But forget about that. Maybe the color coding was intentionally distracting you. Maybe I switched the colors. Can you identify in each of these six cases, which is the F, the YP, the YH, and the Y with nothing other than the images? That would be a good skill. Okay, that is on the website under force damped harmonic oscillator graphs. That's a handout. Okay. So a couple words and we'll take a break and then we'll move on. So what I've illustrated here with this problem and solution is the simple sinusoidal forcing problem. We did that last time too, but I've illustrated this new technique called complexification, which is useful. It's actually useful. This technique called complexification, it was executed right here. It allows us to write a simple table where I can use my love of differentiating exponentials instead of the drudgery of hopping back and forth differentiating sines and cosines over here. So I got a little lag in my video right now. Over here, I had to differentiate sines and cosines carefully. Here, I have to differentiate only exponentials. They're complex exponentials, but if I can manage the complex arithmetic, and I guess I have to admit that complex arithmetic took me one page, but uh, yeah, that's okay. Well, I guess half the page was K1 and K2. Don't overlook this complexification technique. I've demonstrated it several times in the recommended problems. I think it's worth learning. Okay, what we're going to do is come back and do another one as an example. This is a good example of 4.2. We're going to dip into 4.3 now. But 
Let's take a break and stretch our legs. Back at, let's call it uh, 104. And then we'll have some more fun with complexification and we'll talk about resonance. I'm gonna mute my microphone while I take a break.
Okay. Sorry, I misjudged the time here. And you and I don't have the same clock, but I try to keep to the clock on my computer. So I want to remind you of one thing when we go back to those original sample problems. Remember, this is a damped harmonic oscillator. And if I put a minus four in there, well, this is no longer a damped harmonic oscillator because I don't have negative damping. Or if I put a minus sign here, I don't have a negative spring stiffness. So I can't call this a damped harmonic isolator. This is just a generic second order linear question. This is a generic second order linear problem. But the minus sign doesn't stop me from solving this. And if I have a forcing function on the other side, if I deal with that function, forcing function independently of these constants anyway. So I want to point out that what I'm telling you, showing you how to do, works in generic second order linear problem too, not just damped harmonic oscillators. But the most important application is damped harmonic oscillator. Remember, I said at the top of the hour, you're not going to go to your lab at school or workplace and reach in to the spring bucket and pull out a spring of stiffness five and a dash pot of damping four. These are generic numbers I'm choosing to show you how to calculate. In real life, these numbers would be ugly or messy. Uh, remember you have the damped harmonic oscillator in the classical case of mass damper spring. But you also, and let me point out the page, the other place where this is famously used and we said this uh, at the beginning of the hour is in our RCL circuit, 381, 380, 397. I'll show you the page of the book. So this is page 382 in your book. Let me see if I can get this on the camera so I don't have to rewrite it, but I'm going to get it on the camera without setting everything else on the desk. There's a generic RCL circuit. So you got resistance, inductance, capacitance. You don't have to know what those mean. You may not have ever used those unless maybe you're studying the electrical engineering stuff. So with this, you can write an equation where I forgot which the, the capacitance, ah, the resistor acts like the damping, the capacitance and the inductance act like the stiffness of the spring. Uh, Beware, the inductor, that's how you draw that in an electrical circuit, it does not mean it is a spring, it just means it's an inductor. It means a current flows through there and creates a magnetic field. And the magnetic field opposes the flow of current because of that cycling. A uh, classical example would be a solenoid or a switch. The capacitance opposes the buildup of charge. It's literally a kind of a break in a circuit but a break in the circuit filled very close together, filled with material, like a dielectric material it's called. And it allows an electric field to be set up between two plates. And it's a way of storing energy. It's analogous to a battery. Uh, be careful when you're dealing with capacitors because of course a capacitor 
can do the same things to you that a battery can if it's a sufficiently large capacitor. It give you a nasty shock. So uh, don't just drop your fingers across the connecting things on the capacitor. This bad boy we pulled out of a uh, a furnace. And the role of this capacitor was to uh, jumpstart the furnace or help the furnace start faster. So a charge is stored in here. And uh, I'm not a capacitor person, I'm not an electrical engineer, but this apparently is a 15 microfarad capacitor. I don't know if that's super big or super small, but I'm not gonna test it out on my tongue. So capacitor opposes charge, resistor opposes current, inductor opposes change in current, if I remember that correctly. And so you could also write the equation of a damped harmonic oscillator in that context. And I'll show you the page where he does that, just so we're all on the same page, 397453. Here we go, that's what I was looking for. So this is page 397. You could write this if, if you're solving for velocity, uh, uh, excuse me, voltage, then the RC plays the role of the damping, the LC plays the role of the mass, and you can modify this. Again, say page 453, he again brings this back as an example and rewrites that equation there. So this is a damped harmonic oscillator. The capacitance and the inductance, that product X is the mass. Mass opposes acceleration, product of resistance and capacitance. X is the damping, which opposes the change in velocity, uh, sorry, the change in the voltage, and then the voltage here. So I, that's not my specialty. So I just want you to be flexible. Oops, that's voltage. So this is another context in which you would use a damped harmonic oscillator. Okay, so, so bear in mind, if you see minus signs here, that doesn't mean the problem's not legitimate. It just means the problem's not a damped harmonic oscillator. You can still use these techniques. But we're going to go back to damped harmonic oscillator right now in section 4.3. And we're going to talk the special case of resonance. So in this example, let's look at, and I got to say, I got to pick out a special example from the book. Let's look at the case where I don't have any damping. So I just have a mass and a spring with a natural angular frequency as referred to on question three of your test of omega naught equals K over M, but we'll come to that in a second. Is there any kind of bad forcing that can occur? What is bad forcing? Let's see if we can solve this problem in different ways and see what the result is. What I'm trying to say is this problem looks really simple. Just two components, no damping, must be simple. What kind of sinusoidal forcing on the right could cause an issue? with this problem. Well, let's look at, uh, I'll just make up numbers. Like I said, I'll just make up ordinary numbers so I can illustrate my situation right here. Let's put a uh, two sine t on the right-hand side. Oh, sorry, shift up paper. And let's take some, uh, very generic initial conditions like 
Let's go back to the zero, zero initial conditions. Mass will start at the equilibrium position at rest. And let's look at this physical situation. Spring, mass, frictionless surface, one wall, and no damping, just K and M. And if I have K and M here, starting at the equilibrium position with no velocity, well, then it's just sitting there, right? No, it's not just sitting there because I'm pumping it. I'm pumping it with this sine wave. So that looks like this. M, K, my forcing function, F of T. So this is a schematic picture of this. <coughs> so let's solve this problem. I'll call it double star. And I'll give it the full treatment. Star is YP double prime or Y double prime plus four Y equals zero. And complexification time, let's practice that. Y double prime plus four Y and now, what complex function contains the term 2 sine t? The frequency right here is 1. This is 2 e to the i t. I picked a problem with relatively small, non-interfering numbers. Remember, 2 e to the i t is 2 cosine t plus i sine t, two times that quantity. And so two sine t is the imaginary part of this two e to the i t. So I'm gonna use the complexification technique. And let's solve star. That's gonna be done very quickly. So my yh is, that if you like, I'll do a little behind the scenes. S squared plus four equals zero is the characteristic equation of star. And remember that's zero plus or minus two I. Zero means no damping, two I means oscillation. So what are my basic solutions here? K1, no damping, no growth cosine 2t and k2, no damping, no growth, sine 2t. My yh is k1 cosine 2t plus k2 sine 2t. And this relates to your exam problem if you like, in the sense that what I've just shown is that this two is the natural frequency of this undamped problem. And that natural frequency omega naught is a square root of K over M. What does that mean? If you take a spring off the shelf and a mass off the shelf and just set it in motion, it's got a natural angular frequency that it wants to oscillate with. It wants to do two cycles every two pi seconds. Two full cycles every two pi seconds. That's called the natural angular frequency of the system. Angular frequency refers to cycles per two pi seconds. Frequency, when you talk about Hertz, when you look at your radio dial, that's cycles per one second. Cycles per two pi seconds, you just multiply your hertz by two pi. I think I said that right. If it does five cycles in one second, then it does 10 pi cycles in two pi seconds. Yes. Okay, so there's my H displaying the natural angular frequency. In this problem, what's the K? Four. What's the M? 
one, square root of k over m, square root of four over one, which is two. Now let's work on my yp, but I'm gonna do yp for triple star. So my yp guess for triple star, slide the paper up, is going to be e to the i 3t. It's gotta imitate this. I just don't know how many. So I say a e i t, not 3t, just t. There's no three here, just a t. And now I do my differentiating, which is kind of simple because I don't have big numbers involved. I come down, make this EIT. And the next derivative, another I come down, make this minus one. Remember, I do love my table. I'm gonna emphasize the complex numbers. even in the first term. And then what were my constants? By the way, you said uh, you didn't have any y prime in the problem. Why did you write y prime? Well, I needed y double prime, right? So I could say my constants are four, zero, and one. Four, zero, and one, just adding together. So I guess I literally could ignore this line. But I have my constant A, E, I, T. And what is the sum of these complex numbers here? Four times one, no i's. One times minus one, no i's. That is three and no i's. What am I supposed to get? Two, E, I, three, T. Sorry, I keep saying E, I, three, T, just E, I, T. So, Three times A is two. That's not even a hard complex number problem. I hope I'm doing this right. So the computer is gonna verify it, right? So here's my YP for triple star, mind you for triple star, two thirds for the A, EIT. This is four triple star. Now, my problem, my YP is the imaginary part of that YP. So I need to extract the imaginary part of this complex YP. Let's go to the next page. Keep this handy for a second, but so that I don't need to Refer to that, I will rewrite the problem. Y of zero is zero. Y prime of zero is zero. I discovered that my YH was K1 cos 2T, natural angular frequency, K2 sine 2T, natural angular frequency. For triple star, my YP is two thirds E the IT. That's cosine T plus I sine T. Keep wanting to put a number in for that T for some reason. Two thirds times that whole expression. Let's extract the imaginary part. That is not a big deal for double star. The imaginary part is just two thirds times sine T. Okay, it's not that the calculations of this problem is interesting, it's the result and the images when we're done. So now I have my general solution. K1 cos 2t plus K2 sine 2t at plus two thirds, uh, two thirds sine t. And let's find K1 and K2 by differentiating. So I'm gonna keep everything in their own columns, right? 
So differentiate cosine, get minus 2k1 sine 2t. Differentiate the sine piece, 2k2 cosine 2t. Everybody gets their own column. And even here, when I differentiate, let's have a habit of going to the cosine column. Although I didn't keep my cosines before my sines there. That's centered. Let's plug in zero. So I plug in zero here, I get K1, no contribution, no contribution. And that was supposed to be zero because Y of zero was zero. The mass began in the equilibrium position. The derivative at zero is 2K2, no contribution from a sine at zero. But here, cosine zero give me a contribution of two thirds. But that was also equal to zero because y prime of zero was zero. This is not a hard system to solve. K1 is zero. K2 apparently is minus four thirds. Ah, okay, so now things are gonna get interesting. Let's write my final solution. Uh, zero for K1, minus four thirds for K2. So minus four. K2. Before you minus four thirds for K2. Check that. Did we do something badly? Is it minus four thirds? I think it's minus one third, isn't it? Is my brain oh, goodness, yes, you're right. <laughs> yeah, better to find out now. Uh, that is a sine 2t. And now 2 thirds sine t. Now this is interesting for this reason. You may have heard this fact before. You may go back to your trigonometry days. If you add two waves, a sine wave, a cosine wave with the same frequency, Naturally, that can be written as one cosine wave. And I won't bother you with that derivation, but you can find it in your trigonometry book. Uh, it's a homework problem in this book, but it would be cosine of 2t minus phi. It was a phase angle. And this means that you start the cosine wave at a phase shift of, uh, say what's, you're solving for T, oh. You start at T equals phi over two. Now the phi here is determined by, if I remember my formulas correctly, K1 over K2, or K2 over K1. Now you go look this up, I have it, in some of the recommended problems, he has it in a homework problem in the book. So I am not gonna shock you if I say, if I add two waves of the same frequency, all I do is create another wave of the same frequency. I also have this as Desmos demo. What happens when I add two waves of different frequency? Now we could do some more trigonometry identities right here. But if you look this up in your trigonometry book, it's called a sum to product identity. And I think I should differ, I think uh, I should verify this for you right now. That if you have cosine of A plus B, you recall that that's cos cos, minus sine sine, A, B, A, B. Is that how my trig identities go? Cosine will be the opposite there. And the cosine of A minus B is cos cos plus sine sine. 
A and B occur in this common order? Why should we review this? Well, what I have right here, oh, and that's why I don't know this. So I need, apparently, I need my sine ones. So why not review my sine ones? There's a, there's a value to this. Hang on, don't, don't try to bore you with trigonometry. The sine identities go how? Sine cos, cosine. And the plus becomes a plus A, B, A, B. And the minus there changes to a minus right there. Okay, now we can do it. We have a sine wave minus a sine wave. And that comes from those two sums right there. That's why this is called a sum to product identity. So let's say A plus B is 2T and A minus B is T. Right? So solve that for A and B and plug into here. So A plus B sine 2T and sine A minus B is sine T. If you add these together, you get two A's is 3T. So A is 3 halves T. And B, if that's 3 halves T, is 1 half T. Plus cosine 3 halves T. I think this is going to work, so just be patient. Sine 1 half T. And now sine T is going to be the A minus the B. So I repeat the same AB pattern. But I have a minus sign right here. Cosine 3 halves T, sine 1 half T. I'm getting to something very famous that you all know. Now let's take minus 1 third of these. and two thirds of these. So minus one third of these, this is not working out the way I want it to work out. So that's why you shouldn't do trig identities on the fly. So my y of t, that's this plus this, should be the sum of these columns right here. And what I get is, uh, enough to illustrate, but not enough to honestly show you, is it? So I've got these matching terms right here, minus one third, two thirds. I got one third of them. And then I got this minus one third of this term and two thirds times minus one, I got minus four thirds of that term. So what happened is the sum of sine waves is actually a product of sine and cosine waves. And this is added together and this is the part where I screwed up. I wanted this to come out much, much nicer. But let's think about what this means logically. And then I can show you an image in Desmos. We're on page four. So if I graph two sine t, just a generic sine wave, you're used to the fact of calling that amplitude two, right? I'm not gonna put any markers in there. What does it mean to graph E minus t sine t? Well, sine wave is the same, but now I have a variable amplitude. And that variable amplitude means what? It's like an envelope of e to the minus t. 
that the sine wave is diminishing in. So I call that an amplitude of e to the minus t. Now what happens if I had a sine wave like 3t and I used another sine wave as the amplitude, like 1t? The sine wave of 3t has got relatively many oscillations, three cycles every two pi seconds. So that's going to be like relatively fast oscillations. I'm only drawing qualitatively. Sine t has one cycle every two pi seconds, but it's acting as the amplitude of that. So one cycle every three pi seconds might look like this. Multiply the red curve and the green curve. What I get is this situation. Like the exponential act does an envelope for the sign above, the long sine wave acts as an envelope for the faster frequency sine wave. And I should have brought this down here into my basement. I forgot about it while I was on the break. This is frequency one, in that case, angular frequency I'm talking about. This green one is angular frequency two, I'm sorry, three. So what happens, as these, now notice the singular frequency one and two, and they became three and one by this identity. It actually became three halves and one halves by this identity. So this one is three times that one. But what happens as these two angular frequencies get closer and closer together is that A minus B gets small and A plus B gets relatively large. Now let's think about that qualitatively in this picture. This is like the A minus B, the oneness. This is like the A plus B, the largeness. So what if I had something where A minus B was even smaller compared to this red envelope? this dashed red envelope that I'm drawing very crudely, just qualitatively. If this frequency is fixed and this frequency A plus B becomes larger, then I'll have 10 waves in two pi. Might look like this. And I say to you, you're quite familiar with this, on two counts, and you should tell me what this picture represents. Uh, we could kick this around if we we're in a classroom and you're welcome to kick it around in the chat window or vocally, but you all own one of these. It's called what? Amplitude modulation. Well, I, you know, nowadays I cannot say you own one of these. I can't even say in your car you own one of these. But it's an AM signal, amplitude modulation. It's a radio signal where you code the information that you're transmitting in the amplitude by modulating the amplitude of the signal. Maybe this is better uh, since nobody has radios anymore. Every college student has a guitar, right? Is that a requirement of being a college student? That you have to have a guitar and you have to 
dream that you're going to be a famous guitar player. Electric, acoustic, I don't mind. What is this phenomenon for a pianist or a guitar player? It's a phenomenon called what? Beats. When you have two strings on your guitar and you tune one string based on the other string and they differ musically by a fifth in music language. And so you put your finger at the fifth fret on the guitar. Uh, okay, fourth fret on the guitar. The guitar is tuned in fourths. A violin, a mandolin is tuned in fifths. I'm used to a mandolin. But the idea is if you put your finger up the scale, the string above, it should sound exactly like the string below. But when you do that, when you're tuning your guitar, what does your guitar sound like when the strings are out of tune? When you do that and you pluck both strings, don't you hear wah, 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 wah? Because you're hearing the beats. You're hearing the amplitudes being so close together. If the original A and B are close, then the original A minus B is small and the original A plus B is large. You get those beats. And when you get your guitar string better tuned, then that beat lengthens out. And now you hear a wow, wow, wow. I can't sing and I can't play the guitar very well either. But you hear the beats. And the idea is you want to tune, slightly tighten one of the strings until you do not hear the beats anymore. Then you have this strings at the proper frequency, at the same frequency, when you no longer hear those beats. But if you got them very close together, you could hear beats for many seconds. You hear Okay, I can't do this. I should have physically brought down the guitar, shouldn't I? This is why piano tuners make lots and lots of money or they used to, I guess, before you get electronic tuning. You have 88 keys, you have many, many strings, and you have to have them all working together. Six strings on a guitar is trivial, right? But if you have to get 88 strings all tuned nicely together, that takes a skill. So piano tuners could listen to beats that are many, many, many seconds. I'm not a piano tuner, so I don't know. but could listen to beats that extend, I don't know, 10, 20 seconds. Look at, go look this up somewhere. So this concept of having my solution to what? Sinusoidal driving, natural frequency two, driving frequency one. This gives you this sample of a beat. And if this driving frequency gets closer and closer to the natural frequency, then you get this phenomenon called beats like this. What happens if the driving frequency equals the natural frequency? Well, I we can describe it qualitatively, but we can also do it with a calculation, which is what we're about to do. Let's do a calculation. Qualitatively, let's think about this. When these become closer, the envelopes become longer. So the next envelope could look like this. And the Oscillations inside it could look like this. They grow for some time. Of course, then the beat takes over and they diminish. But that's still not equal. If they are equal, then qualitatively, that beat never closes. And what happens is you have an envelope, it turns out to be a 
full line. And when you have that happen, then what's happening to your oscillations? They're out of control. This is called resonance. Let's do a calculation. I can do a quick calculation with you and get to illustrate a very important technique. So again, I'm only doing this with very simple numbers to illustrate the qualities of my answers. So let's say I'm gonna let the natural frequency be two and I'll let the driving frequency be two. Let's say I have my mass at rest in the equilibrium position. Equilibrium position, y of zero, zero at rest, y prime of zero, zero. By the way, now it occurs to me, though this is neither here nor there, and it doesn't really help you, so I apologize. My trig substitution look really sad, sad, sad here. Because I picked sine as a driving function. So nothing collapsed in that identity when I got down to the end. If I put a cosine here instead, it's 90 degrees different phase. These would have all collapsed nicely. I can't go back and illustrate that on that problem, but I can pick a cosine this time. So let's just pick a generic problem, sinusoidal driving, even though it's called the cosine function, and let's rip it out. So I have my K1 cosine 2t plus K2 sine 2t. And remember, this is my double star. So what I just wrote down was a solution to star, which is y double prime plus 4y equals 0. But the problem is, do you see this? My driving function matches my base functions. It's got the same frequency in my base functions. So I have an interference between interference between driving function and base function. My YP, I'm gonna to have to pump up with a T. Now in the old days, if I made YP out of A cos, and B sine, and I multiplied each of those by a T, that would create two product rules in dancing sines and cosines. So in the exponential, exponentiation, in the complex exponentiation, it's much easier. Instead of EI 2T, I'm gonna guess a T E I two T. The real and imaginary parts of this are T cos and T sine. And that's what I need to separate myself from this interference. Let me do this quickly because the result is very pretty. And we're going to pick up using this result tomorrow. Now I have my complex exponents. I love differentiating exponential functions, but I do have a product rule here. So I have to respect that. It's first times the derivative of the second, which is 2i at ei 2t. I don't think I have time to color code this. But then second times the derivative of the first pops over an a ei 2t, right? Second derivative, F product rule again, Another 2i come down, give me a minus 4 at ei 2t. But then I get a kick over here, second times the derivative of the first, which is 2i a ei 2t. But the derivative of this is 2i a ei 2t. So then here I get a 4i a ei 2t when i differentiate this is the table helping me out remember i got 
four of these, none of these, and one of these, four of these, none of these, and one of these. Finish drawing my table. So I literally don't have anything here. But here I have one plus zero i. Here I have negative four plus zero i. And look what happens. The four times one and the one times minus four cancels out. So I have zero a t e i two t. That's as it should be. Because for triple star, the driving function is still e i two t one EI two T. But here with none of these and one of these zero plus four I A's, I have a four I A EI two T. Raise paper. So what does that mean? Four I A has to be one. So a is one over zero plus four i, multiply top and bottom by i. And I'll make it negative i. You get a is four minus i. Standard form, zero minus one fourth i. That's my YP, AT, EI2, T, but I want minus one fourth I, T, EI2, T. I'm a little bit rushing, but I'm gonna have this recorded. This is a constant real number, but this is the cosine 2t plus i sine 2t. Don't forget there's a t there. And this is 0 minus 1 fourth i. What do I want? My problem was the real part of the complex driver. So I want the real part of this for double star. This yp was triple star. So I want the real part of this number, which is when the i strikes the i. Give me a negative one, negative one fourth, give me a one fourth sine 2t, and don't forget this t. Now my qualitative guess is confirmed. I have a sine wave with a line through the origin acting as its amplitude. So my YP behavior is resonance. This happens when you are got the slinky on the end of your hand with a tiny mass on the end, and the slinky and the mass have a natural frequency and then you start pumping your hand with that same frequency. You match the motion of the mass on the end of the slinky. What happens? The oscillations of the mass on the end of that slinky become greater and greater and greater. Resonance. Resonance. Uh, I'm going to cut it off here, but I will show you two Desmos things you want to look at on my website. So on to the technology second. Experimenting with phase shift and experimenting with beats. So experimenting with phase shift, I'm gonna show you or just remind you of your trig days. What happens when you add two functions of the same frequency? I use W instead of omega. So the K1 plus K2 are the different amplitudes. And the dotted green is the sum of the two 
turning out to be one sine wave. Over here, I did this with one amplitude, one phase shift, I use P instead of phi for the phase angle. And the idea is, can you match these two so that they're exactly the same? Then you found the single cos wave that matches the sum of the sine and cos waves. So I'm just demonstrating that if you had a sine and cos wave of the same frequency, you can represent it as a single cosine wave shifted with a new amplitude. And here's the formula I mentioned to you from trigonometry. Square root of the sum of the squares for the amplitude and the tan inverse of K2 over K1. The tan of phi is K2 over K1. So phi is the tan inverse of K2 over K1. And this N right here, you could do some more trigonometry guessing as either N is zero or one puts these waves in phase or out of phase. Okay, that's one thing I'd like you to play with on the website. The other one was experimenting with beats. Here I'm gonna physically give you cosine wave and a cosine wave and let the omegas be adjustable. So here's, this is, looks like chaos right here, right? Two and 2.9. But as I bring one frequency close to the other one, you see this solidify into beats. And if it's very close, well, now it's broken on the demonstration. But if it's very close, then you see this resonance stuff. Let's try three, three and three, four. Since these are not the same, the beat closes. But if they aren't the same, I'm sorry, if they are the same, then this beat doesn't collapse to zero. It actually draws that line like we just did. I, I wanna say more about the qualitative behavior here next time, but I think you've heard the word resonance before. You've heard the word beats before. You've heard of amplitude modulation before. You've also heard of frequency modulation before. It's your FM radio signal. But it's nice to see them. And it's nice to see that they are the natural properties of these differential equations. Okay, let me get out of here. Back to paper. Let me cut it off right there. You can look at the examples I've posted to see resonance and beats in action. And tomorrow we wanna to come back and answer this question. So, if I wanna stay out of trouble, I just should make sure omega doesn't match the natural frequency. I should make sure omega is not k over m. But what if I added damping? Your first reaction is, well, if you add damping, then everything's under control because oscillations are damped, you can't have resonance. But what we're gonna find out is even if you add damping, you have to be careful of this frequency that you put in the driver because you might not cause the amplitude to go to infinity, infinity, but you could cause the amplitude to get out of control. And that is in section 4.4. Undamped, beware of resonance, but even when it's damped, you have to beware that you don't create an unduly large amplitude response. And that amplitude, that extra amplitude response is called resonant frequency. If you play with circuits or things like that. Okay, sorry, I took this too long. I'm gonna let it go. I'm gonna stop the recording first.